On this episode of What's Going On with Shipping, the eyes of Texas are on the new Maritime Administrator. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So the new appointed Maritime Administrator, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, went before the Senate Commerce Committee. And she was part of a three-person group that went up for hearings. And there was some heated discussion between her and the senator, one of the senators from Texas, uh, Ted Cruz, but there was interesting conversations across the board. Uh, what is getting a lot of attention is the issue with Senator Cruz, but I want to talk about her entire testimony and go in a little bit of detail about what she said during the hearing. So this is a story that went out on GCAP. John Conrad wrote this, New Marad Admiral Phillips Stonewalls U.S. Senate. And John goes in some detail here talking about the exchange uh, between Senator Cruz and Admiral Phillips also talks a little bit critically of the Maritime Administration and their lack of, of, of basically any sort of role in the current supply chain issue. Uh, there's the link to the Hill video that shows just that element. And I'm going to show you the whole video here in a second of the whole video, but I'll show you parts of the whole video here. It goes into some detail about her role in the Navy. She was a one star who served uh, uh, in the Navy, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then her really her focus, which is on coastal erosion, she's been working for the state of Virginia in that role about rising sea levels and her coastal resiliency plan. And basically really her, her, her projects, and this is one of the reasons why there's an issue about her view toward oil and gas, because she's been working on these very kind of green projects. And I think that's why Senator Cruz came in. It's also because Senator Cruz wants the approval of these four new ports. So let's take a look at her testimony. So I'm gonna include her entire, the entire video here of the hearing, but also her transcript that she did in her opening statement. This is what this is coming from her opening statement. So this section here talks about her experience coming into the role as maritime minister. Remember, she's not confirmed yet. She just went through the Senate hearing. It would have to be voted out of the Senate Commerce Committee, and then the entire Senate would need to vote on her. During my nearly 31-year career, I had the honor of holding command at sea three times at the ship, destroyer squadron, and strike group levels. As commander, expeditionary strike group two, I worked closely with the military sea lift command to ensure capacity and support for a host of related strategic response missions. As a result of my experiences in this and other assignments, I understand the critical role of our commercial merchant marine in providing the vital sea lift on which our military relies. And I witnessed many of the challenges that confront our commercial fleet as well. Okay, that statement right there. She was a ship driver. Uh, she's a surface warfare officer. She was the uh, first commanding officer of the destroyer Mutston, brought it out of the shipyard and through her initial uh, commissioning. She was the head of a destroyer squadron, expeditionary strike group. She talked about the fact that she has worked closely with military sea lift command. Yes, she's refueled from military sea lift command vessels. She's worked alongside the previous Marriott administrator, uh, Admiral Mark Busby, was the commander of military sea lift command. Admiral Phillips has no experience commanding military sea lift command vessels, working with uh, merchant mariners, SIVMARS in that way. And then her last statement there about the fact that she uh, witnesses many of the challenges that confront our commercial fleet. Uh, she has no commercial background experience at all. And, and that's not to say that that's a disqualifier. I'm just making a statement. She, she just doesn't. The last two commanders of or administrators of Marad before her, Chip Jernigan, who was a captain in the U.S. Navy, a submariner, and Mark Busby, who was a rear admiral, two star, had been commander of military sea lift command. They were former naval. You got to go back quite a bit, uh, uh, almost to the beginning of the 2000s, to find when there was a uh, actual uh, ship captain from the Merchant Marine who's been in charge of Marad. Uh, I want to jump over here to uh, one of her next statements. Throughout my career, safety has been at the forefront of my mission. The foundational priority for U.S. DOT will always be safety. Likewise, safety will be the North Star for the Maritime Administration should I have the honor to be confirmed as administrator? So safety is great, all for safety, all for it, but this is not the NTSB, this is not NOAA, this, I mean, this is not a safety organization. This is the Maritime Administration's role is to promote the US Merchant Marine and, and oversee the commercial vessels, oversee ports. That element is what she's supposed to be doing. 
if you're talking about safety, it's, 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 it's a subset of what you're going to do, and it's great to say this, but not your primary mission. Promoting a strong merchant marine and continuing the recapitalization of the strategic sea lift fleet and support for a competitive, safe, and modern maritime industry capable of meeting strategic sea lift support requirements and prepared to succeed in a contested environment. Okay, that first off, the idea of promoting strong merchant marine, great. That's exactly what Marad's mission is, exactly what you should be doing. The recapitalization of the sea lift fleet has become a bigger and bigger mission for Marad. We've seen, again, last two commanders have been ex former Navy. And in many ways, the, the, the guise and role of Marad has been this idea of strategic sea lift, which is important. I write about this all the time. I'm huge on writing about strategic sea lift. But again, I think appointing a one-star admiral into this position puts it in the subservient role to the Navy, the Army, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Department of Defense. This is a commercial aspect. The way we achieve strategic sea lift is through, yes, a reserve fleet of vessels that we can call upon in time of war, but most importantly is that strong commercial U.S. merchant marine. And this contested environment issue, again, is, is, is a military issue, but this is Department of Transportation, not Department of Defense. And I think, again, we're focusing on the military, not the commercial. Second, continuing the work initiated by TOT and MARAD to address the many challenges at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, including implementing measures to support a safe and inclusive learning and training environment on campus and at sea where sexual assault and harassment are not tolerated. Further, advancing the ongoing efforts to address the Academy's many infrastructure challenges and strengthening Marad's oversight of the Academy, supporting effective governance, and tackling the many other issues enumerated in the study recently released by the National Academy of Public Administration. So she's advocating here for the, the again, which is something I've argued about here for a while and I've had previous videos on this, about SASH, the sexual assault and sexual harassment of merchant mariners. Uh, she's focusing particularly on Kings Point, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. I would argue she should be focusing not just on Kings Point, but the state maritime academies, and more importantly, the industry as a whole. There are women and men who are sexually assaulted, sexually harassed. The, she's focusing on Kings Point because that's where the attention is right now. Completely understand that. But understand, this is an industry-wide issue. We just had the U.S. Coast Guard come out and reaffirm that they will investigate sexual assault and sexual harassment on vessels. That's Department of Homeland Security, but it still should be an issue for the Maritime Administrator. I'm glad she's saying this. Third and finally, to support effective and speedy implementation of the grant programs authorized under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So that issue right there is the other big one. $2.25 billion is going to be invested in ports and maritime administration will have a role in it. I got dinged not too long ago about what role does Marad have in ports. Well, port infrastructure is one of them. They're going to be the one of the overseeing agencies that does this. When you look at port infrastructure, and we'll talk about this during some of the testimony here, you'll see it play out even more. So after the statements, there's a Q&A period where senators get to ask a question. This is Senator Cantwell, who's the chair of the committee, uh, Democrat from Washington State. And she's going to ask the question specifically about the Merchant Marine Academy and Kings Point. Uh, Rear Admiral, if confirmed, you will oversee the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, you, we've, you've heard a lot of the challenges that we are facing there. A uh, report found that the academy suffers from the staffing and leadership to solve some of these problems if confirmed are you willing to step in personally to restore and fix these issues at the academy including addressing this issue of sexual assault thank you chair cantwell for your question of yes uh, i am willing to step in personally to work to address the challenges at the um, merchant marine academy particularly starting with the challenges regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment but also i'm familiar with the outcomes and reporting from the NAPA report and will work diligently uh, with your staff and others and, and also with the staff in the Maritime Administration and DOT who have worked diligently on these issues already to continue their hard work and to make significant progress for the Maritime in, in, Academy. So again, I, I, great answer. I, I don't have any issue with this answer. The problem I have with this answer is this. She is aware of it. She's read the report. She is going to take action on it. She is she's well versed on this topic, yet in this myriad of other questions she's going to get asked, she has no information, no view, no perspective at all. And you know, if you're going to be 
advocating to take a hands-on approach, literally intervene. She used to ask the question, or is she going to intervene? And then the question becomes, all right, if you're going to intervene then, well, what about these other issues that are at play? So uh, jumping around here, Senator Fisher from Nebraska asked a series of questions regarding strategic sea lift. Now, the Department of Transportation through the Ready Reserve Force oversees a fleet of 54 vessels, uh, excuse me, 56 vessels, 56 vessels that along with 13 held by Military Sea Lift Command provide surge sea lift. These are vessels that are in a five-day readiness status, can be activated five days, sail to an embarkation port, load equipment for the U.S. military and sail. Their crews are reduced crews, probably about nine to 10 people on board, but they need another 20 or so to plus up. They draw them from the commercial fleet. And the issues with the U.S. Merch Marine are extensive. I'll include links to some videos I did and some articles I did on this. But suffice it to say, the fleet is aging and has poor readiness. And that's been an issue identified by the commander of Transcom and also the previous commander of the Maritime Administration before the Congress back in 2019, again in 2020, and again in 2021. So there's a big issue and big question about can we successfully deploy military forces? And that's the heart of Senator Fisher's question. Admiral Phillips, how would you assess the overall state of the surge sea lift fleet? We had a conversation earlier um, and I appreciated your comments on it, but how would you address that? We did, Senator Fisher, and thank you very much for your question. Um, as you pointed out in our earlier discussion, uh, we talked about the need to maintain a strong and vibrant uh, sea lift support uh, system in support of our national infrastructure and in support of our national security. And we know from numerous studies that uh, we are not there. And, and so should I have the honor to be confirmed, I look forward to working with you and with this committee and your staff and the many stakeholders involved in this, DOD, Transcom in particular, and others, to find ways to try to close those gaps and reach uh, a satisfactory state of strategic sea lift in support of our national security missions. Do you have any ideas how we can move quickly on that? Well, thank you, know, you for we that. Also, we also talk about government. It just takes forever to get things done, and it's hard to move at a pace that we need to uh, really face and address the threats that are out there. Thank you for that question um, and comment as well, Senator Fisher. Um, as we discussed, it is challenging. Uh, however, uh, with, it is my understanding that within the Maritime Administration right now, there is work underway to begin to recapitalize the Ready Reserve Force now that will begin to provide some um, modernization of that force, which we know is essential. And so near term continuing and, and, and where possible finding ways, and should I have the opportunity to be confirmed, I look forward to working on such things to accelerate those programs um, is a critical first step to uh, achieving what we know we need to, to accomplish our national security goals. Thank you. Okay. Again, I understand, and I got commented on about this, that you know nominees come before Senate committees and they're not supposed to have ideas. They're just supposed to come in and not say anything that gets them disqualified. All right, that's, that's fine. That's your opinion. That's not my opinion. My opinion is, okay, what's your ideas? You, you've been briefed, obviously, pretty well on what happened at the Merch Marine Academy. Why not about Steelhoff? Now understand, Mark Busby has been aiding in her appointment basically providing guidance as the former maritime administrator to her. Plus, elements of Marriott have been briefing her on what is going on. So the idea that she does not have an idea about how to do sea lift recapitalization or a perspective on what's being done, understand it's being done right now. There are issues being done. Contracts have been awarded to Crowley for the acquisition of two vessels. There's been money held up. There's been protests against this. And again, she's got great viewpoints on the sexual harassment and sexual assault issues going on at the Merchant Marine Academy. You need this on sea lift. Where is your perspective on this on sea lift? I wanted to hear some ideas. That's me. Other people will have different ideas, but again, that's, that's me. So the next one that de deals with the Maritime Administration comes from Senator Hickenlooper, Democrat from uh, Colorado, and he's specifically addressing the supply chain issues, about the only question that she receives on the supply chain in this hearing, uh, specifically the $2.25 billion that are being put in the Port Infrastructure Development Fund. 
So I will let Senator um, Hickenlooper talk. Admiral Phillips, uh, and I apologize for having the confusion in our meeting yesterday. Really wonder um, what the confusion was. Uh, in October, the Biden administration announced the several supply chain actions, uh, such as expanding the hours of operation at uh, the Port of Los Angeles. Which did nothing. Uh, the Maritime way. Administration is going to receive funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill uh, to the tune of $2.25 billion for the Port Infrastructure Development Program. How will the Maritime Administration use this funding to, to address the climate, I mean the supply chain issues? Okay, I think that was a word slip there when he said climate change because she's, a, she's been working on climate change with the, the governor of Virginia, but here we're talking about supply chain. I think Hickenlooper just had this Freudian slip. Well, Senator Hickenlooper, thank you for that question. Uh, and I'm honored to have an opportunity to speak with you today. In particular, uh, as you're aware, I'm not yet in the building, but the program that is most- Okay, she uses that phrase a lot, not yet in the building. And, and no nominee is in the building yet, but it doesn't mean you can't have ideas. Uh, effective in the context of addressing supply chain issues from the Maritime Administration's perspective will be the Port Infrastructure Development Program. This is already in existence. Uh, it has been very effective. However, through this it, generational opportunity with the bipartisan infrastructure law, we will be able to uh, do a lot more with that particular program. And should I have the uh, honor to be confirmed, I look forward to working on that. In particular, the program can focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, considering economic impacts and decarbonizing nodes across the mar not only the maritime sector and ports, but across uh, other stages of the infrastructure system. So. Marad's position here and participation will be long-term impact, uh, again, based on what we can do in the, in the, with the PID program, and thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to go back on that for a minute, because, again, she's talking about long-term with climate change and greenhouse gases. And understand, this is a vital issue in the commercial maritime sector right now. Decarbonization, getting down the zero emission on commercial ships is the big issue. I mean, this is the thing that takes time in the IMO. We're talking about zero emission or 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050, but that may push up even further. So this is a, a critical issue right here, but it's not the one that the supply chain is talking about right now. It is in her wheelhouse because of what she's been doing with the state of Virginia. But we're talking about $2.25 billion in port infrastructure. And let me explain what this program is. So this is the Marriott website, and this is the Port Infrastructure Development Grant Program. And basically what it talks about is to promote the effect, and I read it right here, the Port Infrastructure Development Program supports the efficient movement of commerce upon which our economy relies through discretionary grant funding that helps strengthen, modernize, improve our country's maritime systems and gateway ports. Grants are awarded on a competitive basis and support the nation's long-term economic vitality. It comes out of a 2010 law that states the Secretary of Transportation through the Maritime Administrator shall establish a port infrastructure development program for the improvement of port facilities. It goes on in here and, and, and talks about it with more details. She's talking about carbon emissions, green greenhouse gases, which are all important. Again, I'm, I'm not diminishing that issue. But what we're talking about in the midst of the supply chain crisis is what can we do to improve the throughput of cargo, modernize our ports, and make it so that we don't find ourselves in the position we're in today with 100 vessels sitting off the port of LA and Long Beach, vessels anchored off of Savannah, backlogs in Houston and New York, New Jersey, and this issue developing. But she did not address that. She addressed what's in her comfort zone, which you can, can completely understand. But Hickenlooper did not go back at her with that question. And there was no follow-up on this at all. Again, I, I, I'm not sitting here it's easy for me from the cheap seats to, to, to make commentary because I'm in the cheap seats. So I understand that entirely. But again, this is what you want in a Marriott administrator. And I understand she's got a lot of background and credentials as a one-star Navy Admiral, but this is commercial. What's your background in using commercial ports? Because right here, that issue is really important. 2.25 billion, how's it gonna be allocated? What's the plan? Or are you just going to dole out money by percentages and give a little here and a little there. And what we get is no coherent strategy, which I am afraid is what the unwritten plan is. 
Okay, this is the one that got the attention, and this is the five minutes that Senator Cruz has with Admiral Phillips. Thank you, Madam Chair. Congratulations to each of the nominees. Welcome. Uh, Admiral Phillips, I, I want to follow up on the conversation you and I had yesterday. Um, as you know, I have significant concerns over the Biden administration's ongoing attack on the energy industry and the negative impact it is already having on energy production in the state of Texas. In this case, I'm concerned also about how it could impact the application process for deep water ports licensing. As of no November 15th, there are five pending applications under review through MARAD's deep port licensing program. Four of those five are off of the coast of Texas. Blue Marlin, Blue Water, Gulf Link, and Seaport Oil Terminal. So what Cruz is talking about here is the authorization of ports through what's called this, the Deepwater Port Act, uh, created back in 1974. It establishes a licensing system for ownership, construction, operation, and decommissioning of deep water port structures located beyond the U.S. territorial sea for the import and export of oil and natural gas. This is not a port on land. This is a port at sea. This is where vessels would tie up to more to to get fuel uh, to load cargo, largely gas and oil and 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 other basically petroleum products. Uh, there is a extensive licensing process. And in that process, maritime administration is involved. Uh, the maritime administration, the U.S. Coast Guard, work with applicants to meet rigorous review requirements and the expectation of state regulators and the general process. This is about a 356-day clock that runs with a series of steps that are identified here on the website. And I will, of course, have this link available to you to take a look at. And what Senator Cruz is talking about is the fact that there are currently five pending applications. Four of them are in the state of Texas. So Blue Marlin, which is an oil export facility, it's uh, going to be able to uh, discharge 1.9 million barrels per day. This has been in existence. This, this application has been there since October of 2020, so over a year. The Blue Water, uh, also capable of 1.9 barrels per day. That's been since May of 2019. The uh, third one, Gulf Link, a 1 million barrel per day. That's been since May of 2019. And remember, this, this transcends the Biden administration. This is actually back in the Trump administration too, by the way, that this was uh, being done. The Seaport Oil Terminal, uh, 2 billion, uh, two, I mean, 2 million barrels per day, again, January of 2019. And the fifth one, which isn't what Cruz is talking about, but it's out there, is the West Delta LNG uh, facility, 900 million standard cubic feet per day. This is in Louisiana. And it's also back in August of 2019. So that's kind of the background on what Cruz is, is discussing. Together, these projects create thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in economic benefit. Once operational, these deep water ports increase our energy export capabilities, establish greater energy security, and support the environment by displacing highly polluting foreign sources of energy. Even though the U.S. energy-related CO2 emissions have declined by 15% since 2007, and they continue to decline, President Biden and his appointees have been deeply hostile to any and all projects involved in the transport of oil or natural gas. I am concerned that the administration's approach will be extended to the deep water projects that contribute to the state of Texas, to economic and energy security of the nation, and to the national security interest of the nation. Admiral Phillips, if, if confirmed, you will be in a position at MARAD to approve or to deny applications for port project licenses. Knowing the benefit that these projects bring to the U.S. economy and to our national security, if they meet the statutory requirements, should they be approved? Senator Cruz, thank you for your question and thank you for your time yesterday. I appreciate it. As you are aware, uh, and I am not yet in the building, Again, not yet in the building. Okay, we all know you're not in the building. However, MARAD 
under the Deepwater Ports Act of 1974 does review through a system jointly co-chaired by MARAD and the Coast Guard a nine-step process to achieve a record of decision, uh, which then, in theory, would allow a program to move forward should the conditions of that record of decision be met. The Maritime Administration, as I understand, follows the law in that process and works through that nine-step process to achieve a record of decision, working with stakeholders, with applicants, and with a number of federal agencies. Should I have the honor to be confirmed, I commit to continuing a fair and equitable review of that process under the law to move processes forward to achieve a record of decision. So you gave me the same answer yesterday in my office that you would follow the law, and, and my question is, if these applications meet the legal and statutory requirements, should they be approved? And I think that's the big point that Cruz is doing here, is, is Cruz is asking not whether they're going to approve the four out of five applicants right now for the state of Texas. What he's asking is if they do meet these requirements, will you approve them? I think what he's worried about is that the Maritime Administration under Phillips will approve none of these, uh, even if they do meet the requirements because of prospective view against the oil and gas industry. And, and that is the question that he is asking right now. Senator, thank you for that question. Without being in the building and without having detail. Okay, she has a little too much faith in this building. I've been in this building. It doesn't make you smarter, the building. But I, I understand what she's saying, that she doesn't have the legal briefing with her. But she uses this phrase a lot. If this was a drinking game, this we, we would be in, in bad shape about now. Detailed knowledge of each of these applications and their outcomes, I can commit to you that we will review them fairly and equitably, and we will follow the law to okay. complete So you're the not willing to say. Which, which I think Phillips is saying the right answer. I mean, I mean, Philip is saying, listen, we're going to follow the law and we're going to do this. However, she can sit there and say, listen, if, if it does meet all the requirements, I will follow the law. And that means certifying this construction for this port. But for some reason, she doesn't want to say that to Cruz. And man, it doesn't make Cruz happy. Say if they meet the statutory requirements, they should be approved. When should I have the honor to be confirmed? and have actual sight of these applications and the outcomes and records of decision. Yesterday you said you'd follow the statute. I'm asking if they meet the statutory requirements, should they be approved? And I am committing to you that we will follow the law and we will review them fairly and equitably to achieve a decision. Okay, that does not sound like a yes. Um, do you share the hostility to oil and gas that so many other Biden administration appointees do? Okay, now I will admit Cruz gets a little bit personal here on this on this issue. He's asking about a personal animosity toward oil and gas, which again, we see this happen in judicial confirmation, but uh, that seems to be where Cruz wants to go here because he doesn't seem to get an answer that he wants on the certification of the four ports. Senator, thank you for that question. I don't think she really is, is happy for this question, but it's a very good manners to sit there and say thank you for a question that I really don't want to answer. Uh, I cannot uh, answer uh, the specifics of others. Um, Do you have a hostility that, to oil and gas? Uh, the Maritime Administration will review applications. Okay, I'm asking you fairly. personally. Do you have a, a hostility to oil and gas projects? Senator, I look forward to working with your staff in a okay, bipartisan way. So you're refusing way to answer that? To this is a yes or no question. question. Do you have a hostility to oil and gas projects? That This should be a pretty simple question. Senator, I do not have a hostility to following the law and reviewing the process as defined I, in the I, law. I didn't ask you that. I asked, do you have a hostility to oil and gas projects? And Senator, I am thanking you for your question, and I am stating that I will follow the law okay, fairly so you're, and equitably. So you're refusing to answer that question. That's highly disappointing that you're not even willing to say you don't have a hostility to, to, to those projects. That That is deeply concerning. Now, Cruz has been holding up several appointments for the Biden administration. And this statement right there where he's, he's basically disappointed means that I'm not exactly sure what this does for Phillips' appointment as the maritime administrator. Uh, again, you know, the, the question, whether you agree with Cruz's question or not, was, you know, do you have animosity? I think if, if she would answer the first question uh, in, in, you know, if, if it meets the the law, 
then I will go ahead and approve it. And again, I go back to her statement about King's Point and investigating sexual assault and sexual harassment. Hey, I'll be, you know, I'll go down there. I'll be in the building and take care of it if I have to. Whereas this one, she's, she's much more standoffish. And again, you know, confirmation requires senators from both sides. And, and you know, whether you're, whatever your political affiliation is, this is part of the deal with having to get votes from senators from both Democrat and Republican and independents uh, to confirm you. Chris, I think, he, I think uh, she's saying that she's going to follow whatever the administration No, she's not. I'm asking if she has a hostility to oil and gas. It would be very easy. If, if you asked uh, a witness, do you have a hostility to airplane manufacturing, and they refuse to answer that, I'd be, I'd be willing to bet you'd be pretty upset at that. That is Senator Cantwell, the Democrat from Washington, chair of the committee, who is interceding here and talking with Senator Cruz. Look, I think we just made a record investment in port infrastructure, and I believe in an ex. And, an and ex, the Biden an administration is signaling out Texas and refusing to invest in Texas. Well, I think she's saying she's going to get in there and see what the law requires. So no, I would no, like. she's not. Well, so next was uh, Senator Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan is from Alaska. And he will actually build on what Cruz says. Uh, he thanks Phillips for her service, but uh, as he says here, he has concerns also regarding oil and gas. Your service to our country. Um, I do, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse with what Senator Cruz uh, mentioned, but um, look, it's, there's clear to me that there's a split in this administration. Some people get that, you know, becoming the world's energy superpower, more, producing more natural gas than anyone else in the world, more oil than anyone else in the world, more renewables. Until recently, that's where we were. This is just, it's a good thing, right? And you're, a, I'm not even gonna question you, you're a military person, 30 years in, very, very sharp, very impressive. So it's just kind of a no brainer. What's going on, there's a split in this administration. Certain people get this. By the way, if you, if you increased exports of LNG to our partners in Asia in particular, significantly, there's studies that show that global greenhouse gas emissions would decline, would decline. So and this should be a big issue for any maritime administrator coming in. We have since 2016 absolutely just exploded in the export of LNG. And understand, the United States produced LNG vessels back in the 1970s and 80s under the Merchant Marine Act of 1936. But now that LNG export is done on foreign vessels owned by foreign companies. And is a great opportunity for the U.S. to get back into this industry, something we should be advocating quite a lot, but doesn't even come up in this testimony at all. So I think, Senator, I'm not going to dwell too much. I had no intention to, but this is a really important issue to me, too. It's actually important to any American. And unilaterally disarming uh, our energy sector just makes no sense. And the hostility from some quarters, not all, of the Biden administration on this just makes no sense. So I think the worry is if you go through that nine step process, it looks good, the laws, and Gina McCarthy or John Kerry call you, say, hey, Admiral, shut it down, sorry. That's what I worry about, right? So you won't accept outside influence like that if you decide on your own merits that something like this is, meets the statute, would you? They're doing it. I just want to make sure you're, you're someone who I don't think would succumb to that kind of pressure. So, Senator, thank you for your question, um, and thank you for your time discussing the matters important to you in Alaska and others. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, my, my response, uh, of course, as you are aware, I am not in the building. I'm not yet in the building, so I do not have details on some things, Good. certainly. Um, and I think in the interest of following the law, which we've discussed, and we're going through a fair and equitable process within uh, the bound boundaries of uh, not only port infrastructure development, but also deep water ports. Uh, we have a real opportunity here in the country to improve and build resiliency in ports across the country in a bipartisan way to make change and improve our infrastructure in ways that we have not been able to do in the past. Good. So Let me, I will say that. And, and I think that's a great answer. I, I mean, I, absolutely top notch. I, I, one of the things I think that need the Maritime Administration needs to be looking at is seaport, seaport development. And again, what Sullivan is talking about there is export of gas and LNG, but I think more you know, coherent, the problem we have, go back to the previous videos I've done, 
is where we have municipalities and states operating ports in the United States and basically making national policy. There needs to be a coherent national policy strategy, whatever you want to, 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 to frame this at for the development and creation of our seaports. They are a national, they're interstate commerce. The Congress and the US government, federal government has always been able to get you know, oversight of issues when it involves interstate commerce. This is not just interstate commerce, this is international commerce. And the role of the Maritime Administration has been downplayed for way too long on this issue, in my opinion. Again, it's my opinion. That, okay. Um, and I look forward to working with you on that. Great. Thanks. Let me uh, get back to, you know, I mentioned in our meeting the Department of Defense. I actually had the Department of Defense commission a report on the assessment on the strategic DOD strategic seaports, uh, the two lowest rated ports of the 18 were the Port of Tacoma and the Port of Alaska. I know the chairman cares about this issue as well. So what Senator Sullivan is referring to here is the National Port Readiness Network, which basically is a series of entities within the federal government, the Maritime Administration, the Coast Guard, Military Sea Lift Command, Transportation Command, you name it, a whole batch of entities. And what they identify is commercial strategic seaports. And I got them up here in this uh, GAO report map right here. So you'll see these commercial strategic seaports. These are seaports that the US military has identified as being vital. So the US Army just announced we're deploying three brigades overseas in a scheduled rotation. One going to Europe, one going to the Middle East, one going to Korea. They'll load their vehicles on roll-on, roll-off vessels, but the sustainment, the, 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 the food, the, the, the uniforms, and all the extra gear that needs to go will be going on sustainment vessels of the U.S. Merchant Marine. So HOPOG will, will haul the vessels, uh, hold the equipment to Europe. Maersk will take them to the Middle East. APL will do the Pacific. Uh, and, you know, this is a key element that Sullivan is talking about here is, is how these ports are able to respond for the needs of not just the military, by the way, but also commercially to keep our economy up and running. And again, this is where Merad has oversight of the ports. Let's go back to Sullivan here. Um, but will you just recommit to me to work, work with me and I'm sure Senator Cantwell is interested on, on addressing this challenge. I know the DOD is interested as well. This is kind of a win-win on a, some two very important ports that actually work very closely together. Yes, Senator, uh, should I have the honor to be confirmed, I do look forward and commit to working with you and your staff and with this committee more broadly, uh, in, in particular to, as, as discussed, uh, work on port infrastructure development nationwide and, and of course, um, it, with consideration, thank you for forwarding the study that, I, that you forwarded to me yesterday. Uh, I did review it and uh, look forward to working with federal, other federal entities, DOD and others, to make progress in, again, building resilience and sustainability across America's port infrastructure. Let me ask a question. So this question right here and that last one, and it's really the last one Sullivan had uh, basically the last question there for her. Overall, you know, it, it, it's it's a confirmation hearing. It's a confirmation hearing where you want the candidate for a position to come in, not do anything bad, don't embarrass yourself, don't say anything that's wrong. And obviously a lot of tension was geared to the confrontation between Phillips and Senator Cruz. However, I, I, I come back to the issue that you really want people in positions with ideas. Yes, she's a, a admiral, which means she knows how to run an organization, she, she can handle, a bureaucracy, which is great. But if you think about it now, we're a year into this administration. She's still got to get confirmed. She's going to be a year getting up to speed in an entity she has no background in the Maritime Administration. So how much time does she actually have to do anything to actually enact changes? And again, this is maybe not a big issue for most people at all, but we're in the midst of a supply chain crisis that by all estimates is going to go throughout 2022 and potentially into 2023. And add to it the potential for military issues with China and Taiwan and Russia and Ukraine. This is a, a pretty important position, I would argue. And yet, again, I, I, I don't know Admiral Phillips. I don't know anything about her beyond what has been put out there about her. I am sure she is excellent in what she does. You wouldn't become an admiral, I would think, in the US Navy unless you were excellent in what you do. 
However, she's the third Navy person we're having in the Maritime Administration. And the issue right now with the Maritime Administration is more commercial than military, I would argue. Mark Busby was the head of Military Sealift Command. He did everything he could about military sealift and drum that issue to the highest degree and got a lot of attention to it. The problem right now is, is Marad, for example, and the DOD trying to buy used vessels in the worst time today. I mean, vessels are at a premium. They waited too long. They literally waited too long. And buying vessels is a Band-Aid on the issue. The issue here is the absolute collapse of the U.S. deep blue merchant marine. That's the issue that's at play. We went from being the number one merchant marine at the end of World War II to number 21 today. China's number two. And, you know, Britain just announced a strategy to develop a revitalized merchant marine. But we don't seem to have that. And, and, and you know, great, we'll throw her in there and she'll come up with a strategy. But that's what the previous maritime administrator did. And that's what the one before them did. We need people to get in there with ideas and concepts. And because this, there's not time. There, there really isn't. There, there isn't time to learn on the go, which seems to be what we want to do. And again, this is my viewpoint. You don't have to agree with me. And many of you don't agree with me. And you let me know in the comments, you dogs. But that's fine. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. So anyway, that's my breakdown of the confirmation hearing of uh, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips to become the next maritime administrator. If you enjoyed this video, and I imagine if, unless you're Admiral Phillips, you, you, you might have, uh, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the button so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Subscribe to the channel. Contribute to my Patreon page, which will allow me to uh, uh, continue to do this and even more videos as they go forward. And let me be clear about one last thing. I think the job that the Maritime Administration does and everyone who works there, and I know a lot of people who work there, are unheralded in what they do. Uh, this is not meant to be a criticism of Admiral Phillips the Maritime Administration and everybody involved. What I am concerned about as someone who has studied this, has sailed in the Merchant Marine, have looked at this now for almost 30 years, is that we're at a point where the Merchant Marine may be almost impossible to bring back unless work is done fairly quickly. There's not a lot of time that needs to be done to change what is going on with the current course and trek of the Merchant Marine. And that is my reason for this cause of alarm and, and for my criticism, and I, I wouldn't say criticism, critique of the hearing that Admiral Phillips just underwent. And again, I, I think we, there's a lot of finger pointing to be blamed here. And, and I'm not trying to be derogatory to Admiral Phillips, it has nothing to do with her, it has nothing to do with her being in the Navy, it has nothing to do with her being women. I can name dozens of people, male, female, military, commercial, who are could come into this position with a lot of ideas. And let me be clear, Admiral Phillips may be the greatest maritime administrator we ever had. I don't know, because there's no course or track record for how well a maritime administrator does based on previous experience to getting into that office. There isn't, there really isn't. But what I was hoping to hear was some ideas and some concepts. I think she had them on King's Point and the issue of sexual harassment and sexual assault. But unfortunately, I didn't hear it on supply chain on military sea lift, on port development, and port infrastructure. So hopefully we hear more in the future. So till our next video, Sal, signing off.